Hey, what's up? My name is Scott Whitley. I'm the founder of Faithful Word Ministries. The mission of Faithful Word Ministries is to promote biblical literacy among the body of Christ through the serious study of God's Word. All endeavors to represent our coming King with competence. Today's video is part 7 in our progression through Jeremiah. And don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on notifications if you want to be notified anytime this content is public. If you know anybody that could benefit from this content, let them know about it. If you would like to support Faithful Word Ministries financially, I'm going to put the donation information on one of the end cards at the end of the video. Thank you for taking time to watch these videos and engage. Beloved, remember, the more you know the written word, the better you can know the risen word. Try to have your Bible out and be following along in the text if you can. Today's video is going to cover chapter 13, verse 16, to chapter 15, verse 21. And beloved, of all the voices for you to listen to online, thank you for listening to mine. Now let's Bible. Hey, what's up? My name is Scott Whitley. I'm the founder of Faithful Word Ministries. Welcome to part seven. This is chapter 13, verse 16 to chapter 15, verse 21. And these are the nine layers that we attempt to unpack so we can understand the context of what God's trying to communicate to us. This is the definition of those nine layers that we attempt to unpack so we can understand the context of what God's trying to communicate to us. And one of the best verses in scripture, this is this tells us the one thing in scripture that God puts above his own name, his word. Psalm 138, 2 says, thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. God puts his word above his name. Beloved, the more you know the written word, the better you can know the risen word. That's what this type of study is all about, to facilitate intimacy with Jesus Christ. Two of my favorite verses in scripture. This is where God promised to preserve his word forever. Psalms 12, 6 and 7 says, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Seven is the biblical number of completeness. God puts seven days in a complete week. Thou shalt keep them. Them is the words of the Lord from verse 6. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Beloved, this is where God promised you preserve his word forever. You can take great comfort in that. And this is where our story takes place in the kingdom of Judah. If you remember, in the northern kingdom, also called the house of Israel, was taken into captivity and destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 B.C., about 110 or so years later, the southern kingdom was taken into captivity uh, on the third and final siege of Nebuchadnezzar. So that's where our story takes place in the uh, kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom. And then on the right, specifically, our story takes place in the city of Jerusalem. And then by way of review, keep in mind that Nebuchadnezzar laid three different sieges to Jerusalem. The first was in 605 BC. This was when Daniel and his three buddies were deported, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel happens to write his book, Daniel, in Babylon, while he's in Babylon. The second siege of Nebuchadnezzar was from 598 to 597. Now, keep in mind that BC years are moving backward in time, okay? So from 598 to 597, this was the second siege of Nebuchadnezzar, second siege or deportation. This was when Ezekiel was deported to Babylon, and Babylon is where Ezekiel wrote his book, Ezekiel. So the third siege of Nebuchadnezzar was from 588 to 586 BC. Uh, Jeremiah was deported during the third siege, and our story occurs and is written during this period. And during this presentation, when you see the words NEB or NEBU, it's referring to Nebuchadnezzar. And also by way of review, the third siege is about 19 years after the first. These two 70-year periods are not collinear or coterminous. Uh, in other words, they don't have the same start and end date, but they do overlap. The first 70 year period was called the servitude of the nations. It began with the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar and it ended with the decree of Cyrus in 537 BC. The second 70 year period is called the desolations of Jerusalem. This began with the third siege of Nebuchadnezzar and ended with the decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus on March 14th, 445 BC. This is the decree, the fourth decree from Artaxerxes Longimanus. This is the one that fulfills Daniel 9, 25, it says, Know therefore and understand. Now this is the angel Gabriel talking to Daniel. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah the Prince or the triumphal entry shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again, even and the wall, even in troublous times. 
So two very important words in hermeneutics and in scripture, okay, from and unto. So God's making a distinction here from this to this, okay, from the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem and to the Messiah, the Prince, which is the triumphal entry. This works out to 173,880 days. That's exactly 483 years with no days left over on a 360 day calendar. Okay. God has a margin of arrow of goose egg. And then Jeremiah prophesied during the reign of all these kings, Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, formerly Eliakim, then Jehoiakim's son, Jehoiachin. This is the one that God places the blood curse on in chapter 22, verse 30. And then Zedekiah. Ezekiel begins his ministry as a prophet during the reign of Jehoiakim, and then he prophesies even until after the fall of Jerusalem. Chapter 13, verse 15. This is the verse we left off on last time. Hear ye and give ear, be not proud, for the Lord has spoken. And let's ask for God's help and guidance on our study here today. Somebody said that prayer is God's way of enlisting us in what he wants to do. We definitely want what God wants to do. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this awesome book. Lord, thank you so much that we get to talk about the prophet Jeremiah today. Lord, I pray that you'll open our eyes and our hearts. Help us to receive the message that you have for us today. I pray that we won't miss anything. I pray that we won't waste the trials and temptations that we go through in life. I pray that we'll go through those and pass those with flying colors so we can give you the glory. Lord, I pray that you'll guide this study. I pray that there be no more technical difficulties. Father, I pray that you'll guide our study. Help us to learn something that we didn't already know. Pray that you'll help those that are really going through something difficult. Lord, thank you so much for all the good that you do. We'll give you the honor and the glory for the fruit that this study produces, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 13, verse 16. Give glory to the Lord your God before he caused darkness and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains. And while you look for light, he turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness. So there's three kinds of darkness. The first kind of darkness is called natural darkness. That's the darkness of an unregenerate heart. Paul said in Ephesians 4, 17 and 18 that in our natural state, we are in darkness. Okay? The phrase vanity of their mind is another way to describe pride. Paul said in Ephesians 4, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, which is pride, having the understanding darkened, being, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. So having the understanding darkened, how do they do that? Through the ignorance that is in them. Okay, that's our state, yours and mine. Okay. Unless the Holy Spirit does something supernatural, the human heart will stay in darkness. So in our natural state, all we have is pride and ignorance. OK, a one way ticket to eternity in hell. Our employer pays up, pays our wages in dollars. God pays our wages in death for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the creation declares the glory of God, but it does not reveal his plan of redemption today. Okay. Before the Tower of Babel, the gospel was laid out in the stars by order of their magnitude or brightness. If you put the stars in order of their brightness, it presents the Christian gospel. Now, that's, that's the way it was before the Tower of Babel. But as you remember, the Tower of Babel, they mix astronomy with witchcraft and, have, and come up with astrology and horoscopes and so forth. Before the Tower of Babel, the gospel was laid out in the stars by order of their magnitude. Today, there is a curse on the entire creation. Literally, everything is tainted by sin. Okay, that's why we have to die. The Bible says that soul that sinneth, it shall die. So redemption blots out that curse. And the only way you can learn about God's plan is by supernatural revelation to you through God's word by the Holy Spirit. If you remember, John 14, 26 is where Jesus introduces the comforter. And he says, but, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I, Jesus, have said unto you. Okay, so here's God in the flesh promising that he will teach us all things. Okay, all we have to do is sit down and open the book. Okay, so Jesus asked Peter, Peter, who do men say I, the son of man am? Peter responds and says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. To which Jesus replies, blessed art thou Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar means son of, so Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee 
but my Father which is in heaven. So it's God that does the revealing of things he wants us to understand. It's God that helps us understand the scriptures. So it's God that opens our understanding. In Luke 24, 45, right after J Jesus defines what our scriptures are, he says, it says, then open he their understanding. One verse prior is where Jesus defined what the word scriptures means. Jesus said, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms that concern me. Okay. In the end of John chapter 5, Jesus says that Moses wrote about him. Okay. Moses wrote the Pentateuch. Okay. Jesus is all over the Pentateuch. Okay. But one verse after in Luke 24, 45, it says, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. It's God that has to open our understanding of the scriptures. If you learn anything new about God or his word, it is because God illuminated your heart. So the second kind of darkness is called deliberate darkness. And this is where men choose darkness. Someone can actually choose darkness. Okay. People choose to accept or reject Jesus. John 3, 36 says, he who hath the son hath life. But he who hath not the Son hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. If somebody has not yet placed their faith in Jesus, God's wrath is resting on them until they place their faith in Jesus. So God will not force people to love him as we wouldn't want to force people to love us either. God wants us to love him out of a pure heart and pursue him out of a pure heart. So it baffles me that people in the world will judge God by what biblically illiterate people that claim to be Christians do. Okay, that's wrong. We want to be judged by what we do and say, not what others do and say about us. Okay, we could spend hours leaving no stone unturned and chasing the evidence everywhere it goes, but we'll never finish Jeremiah. This is a pretty cool study. And by the way, I'm working on a topical project called Why I Believe the Bible and Everything in It. And this is every single evidence that God has showed me in my private uh, study and devotions since August of 2014. And it's exactly why I believe the Bible and everything in it. It's not written like a book. It's going to be a, a video on PowerPoint like I do my videos, but this is going to leave no stone unturned. I'm going to include everything that I've learned and I'm pulling stuff from numerous different studies, topical studies and verse by verse studies that I've done similar to this. So it's going to be a bunch of stuff. So if you have people in your life that don't believe God's word or something in it, this would be a great resource for them when I get it done. But at this pace, I'm, I'm so busy with work. I have a regular night job and then I'm trying to make videos uh, in, the, in the morning. So please pray for me that I have time and that I don't have technical difficulties. Okay, please remember me in your prayers. So John 3, 19 says that men love darkness rather than light. Why is that? Why would men love darkness rather than light? Because their deeds are evil. People don't like accountability, especially some pastors. They have very little oversight, and that's one reason many drop like flies. Okay? They can do what they want mostly, and nobody's checking on them. Okay? So the word love here in John 3.19 is agape. There are three Greek words used in scripture for agape. There's probably more, but the three used are agape, phileo, and eris. Eris being the marital love. Okay? So men agape darkness rather than light. Why? because their deeds are evil. So the noun agape means divine love, but the verb means, the verb agape means to be totally given over to, okay? So we should be totally given over to Jesus because he is totally given over to us. So he gave himself that we might be saved. And he gave a lot. Isaiah 50 and verse six says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to the men that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. He did that for me and you, my friend. So here in Jeremiah, men agape darkness rather than light. That was me and you. And some pastors ignorantly think they were, quote, saved from a life of sin, whereas me and you were saved out of a life of sin. OK, that's absolute nonsense. OK, don't fall for their ignorance, beloved, and certainly don't pay for it. They were not saved from a life of sin, but that's their mindset. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. That includes pastors. Okay, Some of them have so much pride. So in their pride, they reject what Romans says about man's nature. Watch out for this type of, quote, Christian pastor. Okay, Some of them are very dangerous, extremely dangerous. Okay, So if you get into a conversation with an intellectual agnostic, he'll many times argue that there's no intelligent creator. So the issue is not intellectual, it's spiritual. Psalm 14.1 says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. 
it's obvious that if we can look in the sky and see this incredible creation, that there was a creator. There has to be. Okay. So why does the agnostic say that? Why does he say there's no God? Well, because a creator implies accountability. Okay. People don't want to be held accountable. Okay. That's why evolution is so popular. If there's no God, then we can live however we want. But if there is a God, we got to find out who he is and do what he says. Okay. So evolution is a mechanism that people think will allow them to hide, at least for a while, from accountability. So why do men love darkness? Because their deeds are evil. And it's interesting that people will believe in evolution for which there is no proof. Okay. But they won't believe in God because they want proof of his existence. But they'll believe in evolution with no existence or with no uh, proof of its existence. So people believe in evolution with absolutely no proof at all. Okay. Evolution is not science. Science is testable, observable, and repeatable. Okay. Who can test, observe, and repeat evolution? It can't be done. Okay. So why do we believe Abraham Lincoln existed? We believe Abraham Lincoln existed because of the eyewitness accounts and the written record. Okay, nobody challenges that. So why do we believe Jesus existed? <laughs> we believe the eyewitness accounts and the written record. Okay, it's no different. In 1 John 5, 10 through 14, it says that if we don't believe the record, which is God's word, if we don't believe the written record that God gave up his son, then we're calling God a liar. So if someone doubts something in scripture, they have much bigger problems than understanding the Bible. How can someone trust Christ for salvation, but call him a liar in something that he wrote? Listen to 1 John 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, talking about pre-incarnate Christ, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. The word, as you know, is Jesus, obviously. Okay, but these are eyewitness accounts. This isn't something that's passed down from generation to generation. We have eyewitness accounts. This is the reason we believe Abraham Lincoln existed. I've never laid eyes on Abraham Lincoln. I've never laid eyes on California for that matter, but I believe it exists. So I believe the written record and the eyewitness accounts from other from other people. Exodus 20, 11 and 31, 17 have a very similar message. It says, for in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. 31.17 says, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. For in six days, the Lord made heaven, the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that in them is straight out of God's mouth. So day, the word day used in the above two verses is talking about a 24 hour day, a literal 24 hour day. So the word day when talking about the day of the Lord is a very long period of time. OK, well over a thousand years. So can a thousand years or more be tucked away in the six days? Personally, I don't think so. But I want you to come to your own conclusions like the Bereans did uh, in Acts 17, 11 says the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. But they searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. They didn't just take somebody's word for it because it looks right and sounds good. They went behind who was teaching them and studied for themselves and came to their own conclusions. Very smart scholars are on both sides or for and against gap theory. OK, personally, I don't believe in that. I do believe in the literal six day creation, but you come to your own conclusions. So the third type of darkness, we've had natural darkness, deliberate darkness where men choose darkness. And thirdly, judicial darkness. That's what we've got here in Jeremiah 13. Also in Second Thessalonians 2, where God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Second Thessalonians 2.11, listen to Paul. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So Jeremiah is also going to talk about a lie coming up here uh, pretty soon. So the three types of darkness, natural darkness, deliberate darkness and judicial darkness. So God is going to cause darkness. Yes, absolutely. So what caused Lucifer's sin in the first place? What caused him to sin? Or what was his sin? Pride. Lucifer sinned without being provoked. The name Lucifer is feminine. The name Satan is masculine. The blending of male and female is represented in a pictorial representation called the Baphomet. Okay, the Baphomet is the lowercase g god of Freemasonry. Okay, it represents Satanism. 
Okay. The Baphomet has breasts of a female and an erection of a male with animal hooves as its feet. These blurred lines or blending of male and female is the opposite of what God desires in his word. Remember, Satan is a counterfeit. Okay, that's what Antichrist means instead of or a counterfeit in place of. So he's going to have his version of everything God does. He's going to have his own creation, uh, his own version of the creation story. He's going to have his own Bibles. He's going to have his own books, his own movies. His own, he's going to have his own to counter what God has. And there are counterfeits. And if you're not in God's word every day, you're going to fall for accepting some of those things. So you, you build discernment over time as you spend time in God's word. And by the way, if you're going to search for this online, you should so you know what it looks like. But please don't do it around kids. Use extreme caution. Make sure they're nowhere near your screen. It's not pornography, but uh, it's not some kids need to see. But uh, parents should know what this means. But when you Google Baphomet, just make sure there's no kids around. Use extreme caution. Okay. So we humans are born with a sin nature. We didn't choose a sin nature. And although we didn't choose a sin nature, we are still sinners. If we've sinned once in our life, we're in the same boat as every other human being in history. Okay, we didn't choose a sin nature. So although we didn't choose a sin nature, we are still sinners after having sinned only once. Okay, so we're born with a sin nature, whereas Satan was created pure but filled himself with sin in the form of of pride. In Jeremiah's eyes, he can see his nation being carried away captive, and it grieves him seriously. He's a prophet. He can see what's coming. And unlike Jonah, who didn't want to go to Nineveh, he didn't want the Ninevites to repent. Jeremiah is the opposite. He wants so bad for his people to repent so God won't destroy the nation. The entire nation is going to be destroyed over man's pride because they won't repent. God said if they would repent, he would call off the destruction of the city, but they would not repent. Why wouldn't they repent? Because of their pride. Verse 17. But if you will now hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride, and mine eyes shall weep sore and run down with tears, because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. So this really hurts God to have to say. He's really hurt here. And you can't grieve someone that doesn't love you. Okay. So what's the big problem here that God's pointing out? Pride. Pride leads to destruction and darkness. Okay. So the concept of darkness and light being antithetical is introduced in Genesis 1 and is a theme throughout the rest of Scripture, all the way to Genesis 22. Say unto the king and to the queen, humble yourselves, sit down, for your principality shall come down, even the crown of your glory. So king and queen here is talking about Jehoiachin and his mother, Nehushta. Okay, Jehoiachin was only 18 years old and he only reigned for three months and his mother uh, Nahushta was very influential, so she's why the word queen is used here. The cities of the south shall be shut up, and none shall open them. Judah shall be carried away captive, all of it. It shall be wholly carried away captive. So cities of the south here is talking about the Negev all the way down to Beersheba. Okay, So they were carried away during the first deportation. That was in about 597 B.C., and all that's captured in 2 Kings uh, 24. Lift up your eyes and behold, them that come from the north, where is the flock that was given thee, thy beautiful flock? What wilt thou say when he shall punish thee? For thou hast taught them to be captains and is chief over thee. Shall not sorrows take thee as a woman in travail? There's that phrase again. So the enemies that come from the north doesn't mean they were northern enemies. The Babylonians were east of Judah, but they go all the way around the Arabian desert to invade from the north. So they don't have to deal with the sandstorms from the Arabian desert because they were brutal. You can't move cattle and people and troops and equipment through uh, a sandstorm because it's going to grind to a halt. Any kind of productivity is going to grind to a halt. So, so the phrase like a woman in travail is a popular phrase among all the prophets, major and minor. And in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus uses the same phrase in Matthew 24. And if thou say in thine heart, Wherefore come these things upon me? Wherefore means why? For the greatness of thine iniquity are thy skirts discovered, and thy heels made bare. Can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard his spots? Okay, this is pretty disdainful. So he's basically saying you are so corrupt, so committed to doing evil, that your chances of doing good is equivalent to a leopard changing his spots. And we are no better. 
Beloved, it's by God's grace that we are what we are. If it weren't for God, we too would be in the gutter spiritually. Therefore will I scatter them as the stubble that passes the way by the wind of the wilderness. This is thy lot, the portion of thy measures from me, saith the Lord, because thou hast forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. Therefore will I discover thy skirts upon thy face, that thy shame may appear. So this was the mechanism for shaming a prostitute. To raise her skirt means to shame her. So God's saying that Judah is like a prostitute here, figuratively speaking, and God's going to shame Judah publicly like this. I have seen thy adulteries and thy naggings, the lewdness of thy whoredom, and thine abominations on the hills in the fields, and thine abominations on the hills in the fields. Woe unto thee, O Jerusalem, wilt thou not be made clean? When shall it once be? In the fields is talking about idol worship, and he's describing this as harlotry. Okay, so there are two dimensions to this. Okay, practical and spiritual. The practical one is talking about the ancient Canaanite fertility rituals in which they would participate in and include children. Okay, indescribable filth. Okay, and the spiritual issue, which is idolatry. They were going a whoring after false dead gods. Their lowercase g gods were nailed to the floor. Okay, that's pathetic. Okay. Nayings is a stallion or a mare in heat. So what makes Judah's sin so bad is that they're all having sex with each other publicly. God already said to never even look at someone else's nakedness unless it's your spouse's. And then that's encouraged. Okay. But anybody other than your spouse, it's clearly forbidden to even look at their nakedness, let alone them be doing something naked. Okay. And by the way, sex inside of marriage is not sinful or sin. Okay. Sex is a picture of the cross. Paul said in Romans 5, 8 that he said, but God commendeth or demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God demonstrated his love for me and you with what? With his body. Okay. How does a married husband and wife demonstrate their love towards each other with their bodies? So the agony of Jeremiah is that he's torn between the certainty of their judgment and the hope that they'll repent. If they'll just listen and repent, Jeremiah says. So it's hard to imagine the anguish in Jeremiah's spirit. He's a prophet. He's, God's already shown him what's going to happen to, this, to Judah. It's going to be destroyed. And he's trying to t tell the people what God said, but nobody will listen. He's like a broken record. So Judah's facing the mightiest army, army, army. Judah is facing the mightiest army on earth. And what do they need in order to defeat the Babylonians? More horses, more troops, more equipment. They need God. They need to repent. And this is a real danger for us too, today, beloved, to depend on other things, money, uh, income, rental properties, whatever the case may be, and not have our trust in God. So they needed God and we need him too. Chapter 14. Okay, so there's two types of famine, physical and spiritual. Physical famine, you know what this is. This is where there's no food or crops at all. Spiritual famine is a famine of God's word. Now, sometimes God will allow a spiritual famine of his word. God will allow biblically illiterate pastors and other Christian leaders in positions of authority because the congregation congregations have turned their nose up at his word. They're interested in books and entertainment, but they're not interested in learning God's word. So God will see to it that they don't. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 6, cast ye not your pearls before swine. So God's not going to violate his own word. So physical and spiritual famine, both are mixed together here. Okay. So this is the difficult passage to date, but it's probably around the fourth year of Jehoiakim's reign, probably. Okay, so we want to understand here that Judah was very dependent on rainfall, and it's easy for us to take uh, for granted, take rain for granted, and farmers are always looking for some rain. So this was not true in Egypt or ancient Mesopotamia. In Egypt, they farmed by over flooding the Nile. Okay, so they had a river, and that's one reason they were so prosperous. They dug channels to make the water go wherever they wanted. It was very reliable. Okay, Mesopotamia is also known as the Fertile Crescent, and it had two rivers, okay, the Tigris and the Euphrates. So Judah was very dependent on rainfall, and there had been a lot of droughts there in the past. So droughts played a major role in the happenings in ancient times. So droughts are used to threaten for disobedience in Deuteronomy 28. So Israel was used to the idea that rainfall or the absence of it was God's way of rewarding or punishing them. So that wasn't some superstition. 
That's exactly what God told them he would do in Deuteronomy 28. The word of the Lord that came into Jeremiah concerning the dearth. Judah mourneth, and the gates thereof languisheth. They are black unto the ground, and the cry of Jerusalem is gone up. And their nobles have sent their little ones to the waters. They came to the pits and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads. And cisterns were large reservoirs designed to capture rainwater, so the precious little bit of rainwater they got would be captured. <laughs> These cisterns were empty because they had had no rain at all. Because the ground is chapped, for there was no rain in the earth. The plowmen were ashamed. They covered their heads. Yea, the hind also calved in the field and forsook it because there was no grass. And the wild asses did stand in the high places. They snuffed up the wind like dragons. Their eyes did fail because there was no grass. O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for thy name's sake. For our backslidings are many, and we have sinned against thee. We can feel some of Jeremiah's anguish here. And Jeremiah really praises God here in this verse and in the next one. O oh, the hope of Israel, the Savior thereof in times of trouble. Why shouldest thou be as a stranger in the land, and as a wayfaring man that turneth aside to tarry for a night? O oh, the hope of Israel is one of Jeremiah's favorite sayings. Uh, as a matter of fact, Israel's national anthem is called Hatikva, or the hope. Okay, And Paul uses the same phrase in Acts, Colossians, and in his first letter to Timothy. And this is the same idea that Joshua had when he said to God, the Egyptians will hear about this, you know, you're supposed to take care of us because the whole world is watching. Okay, the Egyptians will hear about this is the flavor of what Jeremiah is communicating to God. So what Joshua did is hinted at in the title, O oh, the hope of Israel, do thou it for thy name's sake. Okay, so Jeremiah is reminding God that he is the savior in times of trouble. Why shouldest thou be as a man astonished, as a mighty man that cannot save? Yet thou, Lord, art in the midst of us, and we are called by thy name. Leave us not. Hey, you're identified with us, good or bad. We are yours. This is your land, and we are your people, is the flavor here. Thus saith the Lord unto this people, Thus have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. So this is God's response for the third time. Then said the Lord unto me, pray not for this people for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and an oblation, oblation means worship. I will not accept them, but I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. So by the sword, famine, and the pestilence. So these three things are linked together here in Jeremiah seven different times. Then said I, oh, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. So Jeremiah is telling them that their false prophets are lying to them. Okay, even though they're God's chosen people, they are still going to be judged. And speaking of judgment, listen to Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Judgment must begin at the house of God. Then said the Lord unto me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination. Divination is witchcraft. Okay. And a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. So divination was a death penalty crime back then. So Judah had fallen so far from God. They told him that they would keep his law. He didn't impose that or force that on them. They said, yeah, we can keep that. But they couldn't, and we can't either. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not. Yet they say, sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword. And they shall have none to bury them, them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters. For I will pour the wickedness, pour their wickedness upon them. So the people of Judah were very complacent. Okay, and that's a danger for me and you to just get complacent and go through the motions. So we want our heart to be hot before the Lord. And 
being in God's word in a serious study like this is a great way to facilitate intimacy, to keep your heart warm and, and, and hot for the Lord. So Jeremiah was trying to wake them up and get them to realize what was getting ready to happen to them if they didn't repent. They were going to be destroyed. Complacency was sold to them by the false prophets. Okay, And there are false prophets today everywhere. Just look at TV and Internet. Goodness, they're everywhere. It's interesting that the first prophecy in scripture surfaces during a time of failure, okay? When Adam and Eve failed, okay? And this was the first prophecy of the Messiah. And it's interesting that God sends prophets during times of trouble. And we can get complacent in times of prosperity. So prophecy is never popular to the world. Listen to what Paul tells Timothy in his second letter. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine and they shall be turned unto fables. And by the way, Jewish fables are forbidden by Paul, and some churches pass around books about a circle, and it's nonsense because Paul clearly says in Titus and 1 and 2 Timothy to avoid Jewish fables. People have no business studying Jewish fables when they're still biblically illiterate. We're commanded to be ambassadors for Christ, and we should be able to represent him competently from God's word, Okay, especially people that have been in church a really long time. Okay. Peter continues, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were since the beginning of creation. So it's not obvious here, but this verse exposes evolution. OK, they believe things that have been have always been the same. OK, that's evolution. They're saying it's uniformitarianism. OK, so what's interesting is that this verse links for us the concepts of creation and the second coming of Christ. OK, what does creation and the second coming of Christ have to do with each other? OK, if you want to master Genesis, you have to master Revelation and vice versa. OK, so both have the same hypothesis. OK, creation and the second coming of Christ, that God intervenes in the affairs of man's life. OK, God intervened to create it in the first place, and he's going to intervene again to wrap it all up. OK, the first time the flood, the judgment came by a flood. The second time judgment's going to come by fire. So both concepts, the second coming of Christ and creation are linked together here in Second Peter 3, 4. The verse we just read the, about the promise of his coming and the beginning of the creation. Therefore, thou shalt say this word unto them. Let mine eyes run down with tears night and day and let them not cease for the virgin daughter of my people is broken with a great breach with a very grievous blow. So this is pretty graphic in the Hebrew. If I go forth into the field, then behold the slain with the sword. And if I enter into the city, then behold them that are sick with famine. Yea, both the prophet and the priest go about into a land that they know not. Hast thou utterly rejected Judah? Hath thy soul loathed Zion? Why hast thou smitten us, and there is no healing for us? We looked for peace, and there is no good, and for the time of healing, and behold, trouble. We acknowledge, O Lord, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against thee. Do not abhor us for thy name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of thy glory. Remember, break not thy covenant with us. Notice Jeremiah's three thys, thy, thy, and thy. So Jeremiah implies you own us. Okay, that's an echo of what Joshua said in the book of Joshua. So Jeremiah is telling God that the world will notice that God is judging his people who are supposed to be the most profitable people on earth, the most prosperous people of people on earth. So, hey, the Egyptians, the heathens are going to hear about this fierce judgment of yours, okay, is what he's saying. So, you delivered us after bringing our fathers through the Red Sea that you parted, okay? So, you can't let us loose because the Egyptians will hear about it and mock you and us, okay? But God has to judge sin or he couldn't be holy. Are there any among the vanities of the Gentiles that can cause rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Art not thou he, O Lord our God? Therefore, we will wait upon thee, for thou hast made all these things. Remember Exodus 20, 11 and 31, 17. It says, for in six days, the Lord made heaven and the earth, the sea and all that in them is for in six days. And remember that first John 5, 10 through 14 says that if we don't believe the record that God gave of his son, then we're calling God a liar. Titus 1, 2 says in hope of eternal life in which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So God can't lie. 
Chapter 15. So there's a lot of references here in chapter 15 to events that occur in Revelation. One of my favorite verses is in chapter 15. It says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. Jeremiah 15, 16. So Jeremiah's message is from deep anguish of heart and very deep loneliness, but absolute dependence upon the God of their relationship. Jeremiah is all about his relationship all throughout this book. Okay. So the southern kingdom saw what happened to the northern kingdom, and they should have known that God was going to be just as diligent as he was in judgment with the northern kingdom. So two different things to think about here, the historical message and a personal message. The historical message was that God is going to judge Judah, this southern kingdom, just like he judged Israel, the northern kingdom. Okay. The personal message is that the words God speaks to Jeremiah for Judah apply to you and me today. So there's a real danger for us, too, to let things in our life become idols. We want to make sure that our focus and attention is on Christ. So you and I might not be burning incense to a 40-foot owl in our backyard, but we can still have an idol in our life. It could be work or money or a person or anything else we set our heart on instead of God. Idolatry is substituting anything in our lives for God, putting something in his place. Just as Jeremiah grieved, because he had to preside over the death of his nation, we too may be in the same boat. So we may be even more guilty because the United States has had the benefit of seeing what happened to the northern and the southern kingdom and all the other nations that God has judged in, in Scripture. If you remember, God allows a nation's enemies to defeat them because they get away from him. God allowed the northern kingdom's enemies to defeat them. The Assyrians defeated the, uh, the northern kingdom in 722. Then God judged the Assyrians that he used to defeat the northern kingdom. Well, 110 years later, God is now using Babylon to judge the southern kingdom. Then, after God uses Babylon as his instrument of, of judgment, he's going to judge Babylon. So all these nations are not getting away with, with continued unbridled sin. And that terrifies me for the United States. So the collective sins of the United States far exceeds the sins of the northern and southern kingdom combined. Plus, we've had an additional 2,500 years to get it together, okay? But praise God for his mercy. Praise God for his mercy. So if we all got what we deserve, we'd be in hell right now. Then said the Lord unto me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. So God makes mention of two men who were intercessors, who stood before God on the people's behalf. And they, too, were, in, were ineffective at interceding for the stubborn and stuff-necked people. Okay, they were two pillars, if you will. Not pillows, pillars. Okay, so Moses with the Torah and Samuel with the temple. My mind could not be toward this people. Whose fault was that? Judah's. Okay, after the wilderness wanderings, Israel had to be taught the same lessons again and again and again. And us, too, sometimes. Okay, when God allows us to go through a test and we fail that test, he will allow us to go through it again until we pass the test. Okay, so me and you have an enormous advantage today. We have a completed Bible to aid us. The apostles didn't even have a completed Bible at that time. So that's all we need, okay, is God's word. The living Christ will illuminate the word of Christ. Paul said in Colossians 3.16 to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Okay. Sometimes we can be stubborn and headstrong, which really grieves God, most of all by our ingratitude for what he's done. When's the last time you thanked God for all the good things he's done for you? It's really easy to forget about all the good things. I encourage you to keep a notebook. I think I've said this before. I encourage you to keep a notebook where you write down at least for 30 days to see all the really good things God does for you. God said every good thing comes from above. So all everything good that happens to you is from God. And so it's so easy to forget or become complacent and not recognize God for all the good that he does. So I recommend writing it down for at least 30 days and go back and look at it. At the night before you go to bed, write down the things that God has done for you, the questions he's answered in your private study, prayers that he's answered, and things that he's done for you that you didn't even ask for. So ingratitude can be a, a difficult one, especially for a parent. How does a parent correct ingratitude in a child? And it shall come to pass if they say unto thee, Whither shall we go forth? Whither means where? Then thou shalt tell them, Thus saith the Lord, Such as are for death to death, and such as are for the sword to the sword, and such as are for the famine to the famine, and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. Such as are for death to death, and sword and famine and captivity. 
There's a similar statement in Revelation 22:11. Jesus said, let him who was unjust be unjust still. Let him who was filthy be filthy still. In other words, if you want to go to hell, go to hell. Okay, if you want to reject Jesus, reject Jesus. Okay, Jesus is the one that said this. Okay, he says what he means and means what he says. The point is, if someone can read from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 and still want to reject God, then that's your choice. Okay, if you want to go to hell, go to hell. Okay, it's not going to affect me. I'm going to be in glory forever with my loved ones. But the choice is yours. The choice is yours. And I will appoint over them four kinds, saith the Lord, the sword to slay and the dogs to tear and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the earth to devour and to destroy. So there's four things appointed by God for Judah's destruction. The sword to slay, the dogs to tear, the fowls of the air and the beasts of the earth. Now, keep in mind, the fowls of the air are idiomatic of demons and demonic activity. If you remember Matthew 13 in the parable of the four soils, the uh, fowls of the air came and devoured the seed, which was the word of God, out of men's hearts. So the fowls of the air came and took it away. So what could Judah have done different to avoid all this? They could have repented. Acts 17.30 says God calls all men everywhere to repent. All they had to do was repent and their nation wouldn't be destroyed. And I will cause them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth, talking about the diaspora, because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. So there's a tradition, not scripture, but a tradition that says that Manasseh is the one who saw the prophet Isaiah into. Okay, Manasseh was the king who really led the nation into idolatry. Okay, his introduction of idolatry into Israel is what led to all this judgment. Okay, that's where it started. For who shall have pity upon thee, O Jerusalem? Or who shall bemoan thee? Or who shall go aside to ask how thou doest? Thou hast forsaken me, saith the Lord. Thou art gone backward. Therefore will I stretch out my hand against thee and destroy thee. I am weary with repentance. So repenting means to change your mind. Moses and Amos asked God to change his mind, and he did. Okay, he did because he didn't swear an oath not to like he did at other times. Here with Judah, God's already a sworn oath that he's going to carry out what he said if they don't repent. And I will fan them with the fan in the gates of the land, and I will bereave them of children. I will destroy my people since they return not from their ways. Their widows are increased to me above the sand of the seas. I have brought upon them and against the mother of the young men a spoiler at noonday. I have caused him to fall upon it suddenly and terrors upon the city. So widows are increased to me above the sand of the seas. That's a lot of widows. Okay. And there are more widows than there are sand in the seashore. Okay. Now we do take this literally here. So we also have to understand the Jewishness of this Old Testament passage. Okay. The book of Revelation is incredibly Jewish. John looks up and credentials Jesus in, the, in John's gospel as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God, the one that was used for the Passover, that couldn't have a bone broken, that had to be uh, without blemish and without spot. Okay, that's incredibly Jewish. The feasts, the nomenclature in the feasts and all the activities and, and rituals around those feasts. Okay, that's extremely Jewish. Genesis is very Jewish. Revelation is very Jewish and everything in between. Okay, so it's literal, but in a generic sense. So there's a concept in Judaism that teaches that if you kill a man, then you have destroyed a nation. Because if you kill a man's son, you have eliminated his offspring. By killing one man, you have destroyed all of his descendants. For example, if there was no man named Judah, there would be no Ur, Onan, and Shelia, Pharez, and Zerah. Ur, Onan, and Shelia, and, and uh, Shelah were Judah's three sons. Later, through harlotry, through his daughter-in-law, he has Pharez and Zerah. Okay, but Judah was part of the messianic line. He was part of the royal male Davidic messianic line. Also, if Joseph would have retaliated in Genesis 42 through 44 against his brothers that sold him into slavery by having them killed, there would have been no lion of the tribe of Judah. When Joseph's brother sold him into slavery, he ends up getting picked up by the Amalekite um, caravan uh, traders. They go to Egypt and sell him into, into slavery in Egypt. Well, Joseph rises to power in the most powerful nation on earth. Egypt ruled the world at that time, and Pharaoh traveled at that time. So Joseph literally went from the prison to the palace overnight. Now he's in charge of the nation because Pharaoh was out traveling. He's the vice Pharaoh. And it's incredible that when Joseph comes to power, 
He doesn't order his brothers executed when they come to get food. He not only forgives them, but it says that he gives them uh, the best of land, the best animals, the best of everything. And the scripture says that he spoke kindly unto them and said, don't worry, I'm not going to take vengeance. Vengeance belongs to God, which is an incredible attitude to have. But Joseph showed mercy. Okay, Joseph showed mercy and didn't have Judah killed when he could have. But had Judah been killed, there would have been no Messiah from the line of Judah. The scripture says in Genesis 49.10 that the Messiah is going to come from the tribe of Judah. The lion of the tribe of Judah came from Judah, the son of Jacob. Okay, that's Jesus. And Joseph showed mercy. David showed mercy too against Shimei, the guy that was cussing David and throwing rocks at his feet. David's men wanted to kill him for that, but David said, no, let him be. Well, a descendant of Shimei, the guy David could have killed but didn't, the guy that David showed mercy to, a descendant of this man, Shimei, is a man by the name of Mordecai, who in the book of Esther counsels Esther to save her entire Jewish race. Okay, Mordecai adopted Esther when both of her parents died when she was young. One woman risked her life to save the entire Jewish race. One woman. So they are alive today because of what God did through her. She that hath borne seven languisheth. She hath given up the ghost. Her son is gone down while it was yet day. She hath been ashamed and confounded, and the residue of them will I deliver to the sword before their enemies, saith the Lord. So the language here is intrinsically Jewish. Okay, The concept of happiness for a woman is to have sons. So complete happiness would be having seven sons. Seven is the biblical number of completeness. God puts seven days in a complete week. But here, the woman with seven sons isn't happy at all because all seven of her sons were killed in one day. So it's the idea of complete happiness being shortened. Woe is me, my mother, that thou hast borne me a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent on usury nor men have lent to me on usury. Yet every one of them doth curse me. So the next few verses demonstrate one of the most moving confessions that a man can make. Okay, here in verse 10, Jeremiah recognizes publicly his loneliness. Okay, and by the way, usury is interest. Christians do not charge each other interest. Okay, so he's not saying there's something wrong with lending or borrowing. He's saying that he hasn't borrowed or loaned, so there's no disagreements involving him. Okay, he hasn't been involved with any commerce in which someone could be upset with him over. Yet every one of them doth curse me, he said. Another way of saying it is, without cause, they have hated me. Well, that's what Psalm 22 says. Jesus said the same thing. Without cause, they hated me, or hated me without a cause. The Lord said, Verily, it shall be well with thy remnant. Verily, I will cause the enemy to entreat thee well in the time of evil and in the time of affliction. Shall iron break the northern iron and the steel? So, if you remember, bronze is an alloy of copper and tin. And something else you wouldn't really know unless you dug in was there in that era, there was an, an unusually hard iron available around the Black Sea. And as a result, there were certain kinds of iron that were very hard. So northern iron here is probably referring to this kind of very hard iron that was available regionally in the area around the Black Sea. Thy substance and thy treasures will I give to the spoil without price and that for all thy sins, even in all thy borders. And I will make thee to pass with thine enemies into a land which thou knowest not. For as fire is kindled in mine anger, which shall burn upon you. So God is really upset here. He's really grieving over how they've rejected him. And as a result, it's going to allow Judah to be enslaved in a land they don't know, which is Babylon. So the language here includes the dispersion of the Jews to Babylon, but also in a much broader sense, it refers to the diaspora, the spreading out of Jews all over the world. Okay. And after the crucifixion, the Jewish people were scattered to nations all over the world, just like Jesus said what happened. So for over 2000 years, that is until May 14th, 1948, the first regathering was after Babylon. After this, the second regathering began May 14th, 1948. That was the second and final regathering. O Lord, thou knowest, remember me and visit me and revenge me of my persecutors. Take me not away in thy long suffering. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. Revenge me of my persecutors. So Jeremiah will often call down God's anger on his enemies. 
Now, we're not allowed to do this today because we live post-sermon on the mount. Jesus told us to love our enemies, do good to those that persecute us, okay, or that ridicule us. Okay, that doesn't mean from another Christian. That means from a lost person. You're to never take that from another, another Christian. Okay, so is this a New Testament practice to ask if God's going to take vengeance on enemies? It actually is, but it's for God to do, not us. Okay, if you remember the beheaded souls of those who were under the altar in heaven, Okay, after the fifth seal, they asked God, how long do you avenge our blood? Okay, but it's God that avenges blood, not us. God takes, God said, I'll, I'll take vengeance. It's up to God to take vengeance, not us. So the concept of being in line or agreeing with God's righteous indignation is not unbiblical. Okay, but the Bible tells us clearly to not rejoice when our enemy falls, unless it displeases the Lord and he withdraw his anger from them. So the imprecatory Psalms call for retribution against David's enemies. Now, we're not allowed to pray that, like I said, because we live post Sermon on the Mount. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts. What an awesome verse. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. So there's a lot here. So what made an Old Testament sacrifice clean or not? It had to be an animal that chewed the cud. So Romans 12, 2 says that we are to be living sacrifices. We have to die, but not physically, okay, only spiritually. So we are to be living sacrifices that chew the cud. The cud is God's word. So Ezekiel 2, 8 through 3, 3 is a similar passage. Here, God tells Ezekiel to eat and digest God's word, and sometimes we even digest a lesson, okay? In, Re in Revelation 5.1, we see a scroll sealed with seven seals written within and without. Or Revelation 10.9 is where the angel tells John to, quote, take it and eat it up. Okay, and Revelation is incredibly Jewish. It's everything in it's Jewish. So to understand Revelation well, we need to understand our Old Testament well, too. And the New Testament writers take for granted that we understand our Old Testament well. Okay, that's why they use uh, the, the Old Testament idioms in the book of Revelation. Jeremiah uses some, too. So we are commanded to, commanded to diligently search the scriptures. Jesus said in John 5, 39, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. And you remember Acts 17, 11, talking about the Bereans being more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So a clean Christian is one that studies his or her Bible and does what it says. Christians are to be clean, living sacrifices. So one of the reasons I'm so enthusiastic about God's word is because of the overwhelming evidence of deliberate design, okay? An integrated whole, a singular message system. And thank you, Dr. Missler, for pointing that out and for pointing everything else out. So the first 65 books come together in Revelation, the final and 66th book. So, when we read Jeremiah and come across these phrases, we're conscious of the fact that these phrases are peppered all throughout the Bible. Okay, this is proof of a single author. Okay, he's responsible for bringing, God is responsible for bringing over 40 men over thousands of years from geographic areas far removed all together to put his word onto paper. Okay, God promised to preserve his word forever in Psalm 12, 6 and 7. Thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Why? For I am called by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts. So this is one of many verses that links God's word with his name. And the one thing in scripture that God puts above his own name, his word. Remember Psalm 138, 2, thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. So God puts his word above his name. And God's word was sweet to Jeremiah's mouth. So even though Jeremiah was personally rejected publicly, he never wavered in his commitment to God's word. He was faithful, diligent, and he delighted in God's word. How about you? Are you delighting in God's word? God's word was sweet to Jeremiah's mouth, but bitter to his belly, so bitter that it made him weep. So Jeremiah and Ezekiel's experience is no different than John's experience in Revelation 10. And there's a sweetness to it, but as you digest it, it gets bitter. Jeremiah, on the one hand, was privileged to be on a face-to-face -face basis where he was God's messenger to his nation. That was a privilege and something Jeremiah really cherished, despite the fact that his particular message was extremely bitter for him to deal with. The certainty of the judgment of his nation that he loved so dearly. 
I sat not in the assembly of the mockers, nor rejoiced. I sat alone. This is Jeremiah talking to God. Because of thy hand, for thou hast filled me with indignation. So this is a very difficult situation for Jeremiah to be in. Can you imagine everybody being against you, not having a single friend to stand or serve with you? That would be really tough. So Jeremiah has a complaint. I have not sat in the assembly of the mockers. So Jeremiah is miserable at his circumstances. Okay, I have been too at times and because of uh, the way certain people treated me. But it's easy to be miserable at circumstances sometimes. It could be a financial issue, a health issue, a relationship issue, or whatever. But in verses 17 and 18, Jeremiah gets really upset, but God answers him. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable, which refuseth to be healed? Wilt thou be unto me as a liar and as a waters that fail? And as waters that fail. So that's a phrase that we're not really familiar with too much that day. It's spoken of in the Middle East, though. So waters that fail means a deceitful brook. Okay, this is a brook that only occurs when there's a flash flood. Okay, this happens in California. They call it a wash. Okay, it's a brook that is unreliable. Okay, it only holds water for snow or after a hard rain or some other unusual circumstance. So it's not a brook you can count on. It's deceptive and will not be there when you need it. Okay, here today, gone tomorrow kind of idea. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, if thou return... Then will I bring thee again, and thou shalt stand before me. And if thou take forth the precious from the vial, then thou shalt be as my mouth. Let them return unto thee, but return not thou unto them. So God lovingly rebukes Jeremiah for his despairing here. And return means to repent. So Jeremiah is complaining, and God says, wait a minute, time out. Hold it right there, buddy. And I will make thee unto this people a fenced brazen wall. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee to save thee and to deliver thee, saith the Lord. So God says to Jeremiah, if you'll shape up and trust me, I will make the offense brazen wall and your enemies will not prevail against you. And I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked and I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. So God told Jeremiah that he will be attacked. But God said, I will, for I am with thee to save thee and to deliver thee, saith the Lord. In essence, God tells Jeremiah, don't waste your time on foolish statements. Let's get on with it. There's work to do. Moses experienced this too in Exodus 4. And after this complaint, Jeremiah doesn't do it anymore for the rest of the book. And some scholars consider this a reconditioning of sorts of Jeremiah. He never again gets the woe is me's. Before, when those people tried to assassinate Jeremiah, they didn't succeed. But they did succeed in killing Adelia, who was the governor of Judea, after uh, the governor of Judah after the fall of Jerusalem. So these guys didn't mess around. They knew how to pull off an assassina assassination if they wanted to. But they were unable to kill Jeremiah because Jeremiah was being protected by God himself. So Jeremiah's joy and refreshment in God's word is a theme that's popular throughout Scripture. Okay. Remember Psalm 119, the Psalm of the Laver? Okay. Now we have to wash daily in God's word. Laver is what the Old Testament priest washed in to get clean in the tabernacle. Okay, 172 out of 176 verses in Psalm 119 refer to God's word directly. Okay, Psalm 119 is about how you, how you should eat it, digest it, and refresh yourself in it. And remember, the laver was an Old Testament instrument in the tabernacle. So if you really study the temple, you can't help but be fascinated by all the dimensions and materials and procedures to build it. And God laid out his specifications precisely, except there was one dimension that God left out, that he omitted. Okay, there's no dimension for the labor. Okay, and that's deliberate because there's no limit to the washing of God's word that we are to do daily. <laughs> that's why there's no dimension for the labor. Everything else has a dimension and a tolerance and a specification to be built to. But the labor has no such dimension. OK, because there's no limit of the washing of God's word that we are to do daily. That's pretty awesome. So the Old Testament priest washed in the labor and you and I are washed judiciously in the blood of Jesus once and for all when we placed our faith in Jesus. And sanctification is where we wash in God's word every day. So we're to wash ourselves in the word daily by studying the word and doing what it says. Paul said in Ephesians 4, 4, by the washing of the water of the word. Okay, washing of the water by the word. So this concept is present all throughout scripture. 
Okay. What's interesting is that in Revelation, the phrase that is translated molten sea has the same meaning in the Old Testament. So it means brass labor. Molten means bronze and sea means labor or the washing bowl. In Revelation 1, 4, when the saints are standing around the throne with the 24 elders, they take their crowns and lay them down on the glassy sea. So that which you're washing in while you're on earth is that which you're standing on before the throne. OK, so we're definitely dealing with a pun here. The Holy Spirit uses the word of God as a pun sometimes. If you remember Hosea 12, 10, God said, I have multiplied visions. I've spoken to the prophets, multiplied visions and used the similitude by the ministry of the prophets. A similitude is a rhetorical device. It's a simile, a pun, a metaphor, a type, foreshadowing, an analogy uh, and so on. So the Holy Spirit uses God's word as a pun sometimes. We wash in it here we'll stand on it there. OK, that's pretty awesome. And just like the old hymn says, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of Christ, my king, through the eternal ages, let his praises ring. Glory to the highest. I will shout and sing standing on the promises of God. How awesome. What an awesome song. So you and I need to be washing every day that we are alive in God's word. And don't confuse being washed in Jesus blood once and for all. That's our justification with being washed daily in God's word, which is our sanctification. So justification saves us from the penalty of sin. That's eternity in hell. Sanctification saves us from the power of sin, like addiction or biblical literacy and so on. And glorification saves us from the presence of sin. That's when we'll live forever in heaven with Jesus. And beloved, we're going to leave it here for today. Thank you so much for taking uh, your time to engage with me here in this video. Please remember, be in your prayers. I love you, and we'll see you in the next video.